You know, we're all here for, well, in my view, for a common reason. Um, our, our goal as policymakers, educators, researchers, business leaders, academics, whoever you are, I mean, you're the design, you're the brain trust of this country. And I think all of us can see a future that will not be ours unless we figure out how to really translate what we know and what we want for students into some real deliverables that will elevate what I always call the top 100% of youth and adults in this country. And, and, you know, that to me is one of the world's biggest, greatest ideas ever. And so this, you know, great ideas fest, um, big ideas fest, really when you think about this country and what was guaranteed, it's really the fundamental success of those students translated to another big idea, um, which is our American system of government. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Those were Abraham Lincoln's words. And I'm using them tonight because I'm so worried about the government, and I'm so worried about the communities, and I'm so worried about how we're living together in this society that we must, we absolutely must raise the achievement levels, we must raise the expectations, and we must raise what students do so that they can demonstrate that they will become our future leaders, that they will become the workers of this country that we expect. And we've had a tremendous decline. You know, it was very depressing to me to sit in a meeting about the Common Core Standards in K-12 and have the head of the American Language Association stand up and tell the group, there are probably several hundred people like you in, the, in that audience all wanting to figure out how we can have a common framework for what students should know and be able to do. And he stood up and said, do you know that this country, that, that reading scores for fourth grade students have stayed stagnant for 40 years? And so if you look across at Shanghai or Korea, um, many other countries in the world, you know, we're 16th in the, net, you know, right now, we're 16th in the world in terms of college attainment for people who are 25 to 34 year olds. We're 16th in the world. We were number one a generation ago. So we have tremendously declined. And, you know, when I go back to sort of our system of government and how we're behaving, and Washington certainly is in the spotlight each and every day. Um, you know, I think about the Founding Fathers, and I'm sort of on this civic education kick uh, because I'm very worried that our conversation about jobs has got to be coupled with a conversation about critical thinking and about society and about it's, it's a lot more than jobs, and they're not, and, you know, they're not antithetical, that we need people to think critically to be great in their jobs but we also need them to be great in their communities. And so I have a little quote from Jefferson, uh, who said that his first and last public concern was to establish a system of general education which shall reach every description of our citizens from the richest to the poorest. So, you know, why did Jefferson care so much about democratizing education? And he said to that question, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. So certainly, you know, after almost three years now in, in Washington and coming from a very long career with students, taught high school, taught community colleges, was a chancellor and so on, um, as no, you know, from, in my opinion, um, at no time has education mattered more to the strength of our nation or to the vitality of our democracy. I really think that our democracy is at, trem at a tremendous crossroads. Um, and our challenge is going to give every single learner, and that's where technology comes in, and that's where innovation and creativity comes in, that's where institutions that are looking at competency-based education and all of that, 
um, are going to figure out, you know, how are we going to educate the most diverse population that this country has ever seen, and in fact, that the world has ever seen. So um, I think the way we're going to do this is not just to prepare students for jobs, but to really think about how to add to that, helping them really embody the kinds of values and responsibilities for their own families, for themselves, for their communities, and for society. And you know, President Obama and Secretary Duncan, and you'll hear them probably, they'll, they'll put out some advisories tomorrow, um, talk about education as not only an economic imperative, but a civic and moral imperative. And I think we have to have that framework, and I hope at this big Ideas Fest, you'll have that framework and really push for that. Because it is about jobs, but it's also about who. Who are we training? Who is going to lead this society going forward? Um, we're undertaking all of this work at a time when public investment in education, and especially in public education, is under severe strain. I think most of you, if you're in an institution of higher education or you're in a K-12 school, you're doing more with less. Uh, and you've probably done more with less for the last five years because the economy has been what it's, what it's been. And so what we think in Washington is how can we use levers of change to leverage innovation, to increase efficiency, to be more productive, and using, doing so, really thinking about how do we scale up what we know works, and how can we support the promising practices that will help us improve the outcomes for each and every student. And it does go back to the student. So what stands in a way, in the way? You know, why are we, why do we have the reading scores for 40 years being stagnant? And what is the enemy of innovation um, and creativity? And I think it's complacency. You know, many of us have had the belief that we're so strong as a country, we're so good, that nothing will undermine our core values, our beliefs, and the knowledge system that's formed at the foundation of our middle class. And it's really causing people like me and many others of you, I think, to think through where we are today. It's really, really different. Um, when I look across and I think about K-12, um, we've got a quarter of students in K-12 that aren't finishing high school. And in some areas of the country, more than 50% of young people aren't finishing high school. Um, and you know, by not finishing high school, that 25% is the equivalent of a permanent national recession. That's how much capital, how much human talent we're losing as a nation. Um, we have two to three million jobs today in this country that are not filled. And employers have to go abroad because they can't find people here ready to do those jobs. So we're not producing enough qualified workers. And really the need to think about from a higher education perspective, where is that gap and how can we close that? As I said, we're 16th in the world. We used to be first. And that's why Secretary Duncan and all of us who came to Washington really are thinking not only about today, but tomorrow. You know, what can we do at all levels of education so that not only this generation has a better opportunity, but that the generations that are now in elementary school are now being born will have much better opportunities than many of the people in this country for the last 20 and 30 years. Um, Arne Duncan talks a lot about changing the Department of Education from a compliance-driven bureaucracy to an engine that will empower local communities, local innovation, states. What kinds of levers should we, should we be thinking about at the federal level? Because I think those of us who came to Washington really know that the best ideas are right in this room. The best ideas are going to happen in the classrooms, in the schools, in the universities. They aren't going to be thought up by government workers in Washington, DC. And so what do we do in Washington to create a climate for the kind of change that is going to get to better outcomes for the people that we, we are elected to serve, that we are appointed to serve, that we volunteer uh, to be in a classroom, or to be an educator, or to be a policymaker? So to, to achieve the kinds of reforms that I think all of us are thinking about, and you came to this conference certainly because you've got lots of ideas, um, for us we have to think really clearly about what do we do to incentivize positive change at the local level, at the state level, 
and at the federal level. I call it national. And how do we think about public-private partnerships, public-public partnerships, and ways that we can cross-pollinate the best ideas to do that? So we've got to, in our view, use the best levers at our own disposal in Washington to unleash a wave of big ideas that are going to sweep the nation. So we have levers, like we can support the Congress to write new laws, brand new laws. We can reauthorize, like we're trying to do with the Elementary and Secondary Act, uh, reauthorize existing laws to be better. Workforce Investment Act, Perkins, uh, K-12, the Higher Education Opportunity Act, all of those are up for reauthorizations in the next couple of years. Um, we can take existing regulations like FERPA. We just this week released new FERPA guidance that will allow universities and high schools and elementary schools and uh, public county hospitals to share data. That's a big one. There's been a lot of confusion about that. So we can take regulations and interpret them in smarter, better ways. And we can also use accountability mechanisms. We can use hammers and sticks. We can use incentives. And we can use transparency. That's a tremendously powerful lever of change. Uh, and communication, certainly what Arne Duncan talked about, college affordability this week. It was a harbinger if you read the newspapers. That is going to be a big conversation for us. Um, at the department, we are thinking about these levers strategically, all for one purpose. How do we really move toward what President Obama has called that goal of becoming the best educated, most competitive workforce in the world. I call it the 2020 goal, but really, when you think about what we're doing in early learning, it's really the 2030, 2040, 2050 goal, because we've got to get young children ready to be ready for kindergarten. Right now, a third of children are not ready for kindergarten. And with the fourth grade reading scores and 25% you know, dropping out of high school, and then when you go up the chain, 50% aren't completing college within six years. So it is a pipeline issue. We have tremendous gaps. We have achievement gaps. We have articulation gaps. And we have tremendous things to do together. So our efforts, um, you've seen us take the Recovery Act money. We created Race to the Top. Um, we've created Investing in Innovation. We have a National Education Technology Plan. We've got Higher Ed Agenda for College Completion. And for three years, we've really tried to advance a comprehensive cradle-to-career agenda. The first early learning funds are being given out this month. We're very excited about that. We've got the K-12 policies. We've got uh, 11 states in the District of Columbia doing race to the top reforms in teacher evaluation and student achievement models. Um, we want to see what those states will come up with for K-12 schools. Secretary Duncan calls all of this the quiet revolution. And so what I want to do is just give you a, a few examples of what we've done in each of these sectors. So in K-12 education, we really have tried to defy the, the past of giving a little bit of money to everyone. Everyone got formula money. That leads to complacency. Um, you dole it out. Everybody's happy, but change doesn't occur. And you've got the same old, the same old for many years in a row. So with Race to the Top, our goal was to reward plans that really challenged the status quo, that used evidence in a much smarter way, and could put in place some ideas that could be scaled up locally or statewide, or even, we hope, nationally. We're looking at these states to see what are they doing differently in Louisiana in teacher evaluation, and could that be a harbinger of what other states may want to do? What are they doing in Massachusetts with the student growth model to increase achievement? Could that be something that other states would want to benefit from? We think many of these states are going to be leading the way by adopting practices that actually will, will improve the quality of education. They will align classroom instruction with college and career ready standards. That's going to be very hard to do. They're using data in better ways. We've got the FERPA guidance out now. We'll have some race guidance out pretty soon. And many states are turning around the lowest performing schools. Arne Duncan has talked quite a bit about how the 5,000 worst schools in the country have been stagnant for far too long, have failed too many children. So we've come up with some models for states to adopt and school districts to use that will actually turn around what's happening there to make them better. 
But what's happened that I think is more, even more innovative or as innovative as Race to the Top and the I3 program is that the states that didn't win the grants have also started to make some significant progress in implementing their own groundbreaking reforms. Since 2009, when we came into office, 45 states and the District of Columbia have adopted the Common Core standards that have the promise to really ramp up the achievement levels and the expectations for entering freshmen from high school. If we can really do that for K-12, we'll be going a long way to help this nation move forward. 44 states have joined two different consortia to look at assessments that have the promise to really reform how we think about testing. Testing's broken in this country. Teachers don't feel creative. You feel that you're teaching to the test, those of you who are teachers. And we have failed there. And I think we, we really hope that these consortia will think about modernizing the whole way we think about and implement assessments. Um, we've got people across the board that have rallied together. We've got a new $500 million Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Fund that I mentioned that has the opportunity with Health and Human Services to really transform the impact for the youngest children in the country by giving states incentive to develop high quality early learning systems. And 35 states actually submitted bold, reform, uh, for early, bold reforms for early learning. They'll just have a few states that are selected um, and the competition will be out this week. But we're very excited about that. It's a start to say it's unacceptable for this country to have a third of children not ready for kindergarten. And at the local level, the Investing in Innovation Fund is having a similar effect that Race to the Top is having at the state level. Um, there were three types of funding for school districts. The levels of funding uh, were given for development, for validation, and for scale-up grants. So there were three tranches of funding that you could apply for. And to be funded, the applicants had to secure a private match for at least 5% of the money that they asked for for scale-up, 10% of validation, and 15% of development dollars. And the idea there was to match, to have local businesses, local schools, foundations, and other people say that this is worth it, that this idea, this promising practice, this innovation is going to benefit this community, this school, and we are investing our own dollars and our own time in this as well. We're going to be documenting those practices. Right now, you can go out to the web and take a look at all of those proposals that were funded, and you can also see the ones that weren't. We had, uh, last year, 49 funded. We had um, 1,700 applicants. This year, even with fewer funds, from 600 submissions, we funded 23. And we think all of these grantees are going to really innovate uh, in some very exciting ways, from improving STEM to increasing high school graduation rates to improving college enrollments and high school articulation to college in rural parts of the country. We had a rural uh, community set aside. And really to the turnaround school models to really study what could be done differently there. And what's interesting also is that corporate and private philanthropies have looked at programs that weren't funded and put dollars into those programs. So at the same time, while we're, we're doing this, um, last month the secretary announced a new partners in learning uh, contract with Microsoft who is going to actually oversee what, what we call our Teach Grant program. It's a teach campaign and a website that'll show all the jobs available for teachers, that will show what the standards are, where you can get a good quality education if you want to become a teacher, and it really is to try to, as a first step, raise the reputation of the teaching profession. You know, there have been many critics that talk about people that go into teaching are from the bottom third of their graduating classes. And so what we want to do is ramp up to have a much wider uh, scope in the TEACH campaign to allow higher performing people to think about becoming teachers. And it's a national recruiting effort that is going to connect teachers with job opportunities for preparation and licensing and help existing teachers get better professional development. So you'll be hearing a lot about that through the Partners in Learning, Partnership and Learning Program, and we're very excited about that. Um, they are going to really ramp up the TEACH website. You can go to teach.gov right now and see what's out there. And you know, with our goal to hire a million teachers over the next decade, this is a tremendous opportunity. Who those teachers are to get the very best people we can find in this country 
to think about becoming a teacher and get into a school of education or an alternative program and do well there, um, it's very exciting for us. So even as we're doing this, we're also looking at ways to address what can sometimes be the painfully slow pace of change in Washington. And I can tell you that it can be very frustrating. Um, so what we have provided for all states to reform K-12 is a flexibility program, a waiver program, so that states that want to move ahead and change what wasn't working and no child left behind would be able to have some waivers to be able to do things differently and have the flexibility to be freed up from certain NCLB provisions to really implement the growth model that I talked about. Um, so we had a number of states applying for that. We've got many, many states. 39 states are planning to come in and ask for waivers in February. We've already uh, supported 11 states that have already to date asked for waivers. It just came out. So it shows you that something needs to change, that people in this country that are working in K-12 states really want to have the flexibility to do things differently. But we know that the current law, No Child Be Left Behind, despite some of its strengths, is broken. And states need the opportunity right now to develop locally tailored solutions, that's what the country is telling us, to the educational challenges that they have while they raise standards and while they maintain high levels of accountability. And so in this case, good governance, good governance includes the, the using the federal levers of change to provide relief for states for the kinds of reforms they want to do, even while we sit and work with Congress to actually fix the law. We have ask, been asking Congress to fix uh, the education, you know, the No Child Left Behind law now for over, well, since we came to Washington. So without that, the waiver is a solution that has really tried to create change even despite um, the paralyzation that, that sometimes overcomes Washington. Now looking at the college and career, and I know this really well, um, in the first year of the administration, we actually passed a package of reforms that had to do with Pell Grants. And what we did was, I, I was telling uh, someone in the audience earlier, my, my favorite quote is, things should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And that's Albert Einstein said that. And so the idea was, could we give checks to students directly for Pell Grants from the Treasury rather than funneling the mother, m money through the banks? Could we cut out the middleman and give a check directly to students? So this was a very intricate partnership with the Social Security Administration and the IRS and the Federal Student Aid Program and the Department of Education. And toward that end, yes, we were able to do that. It was very difficult. It was a very tough fight. But in 2010, in March, we passed the Student Loan Reform Bill. It was called SAFRA. And it included about $40 billion to expand federal aid to the poorest students in the country. And so today, what's very exciting, someone was asking me what was the big takeaway um, in my first two years. And it was actually to take 6 million students to 9.4 million students today who are enrolled in higher education who are Pell eligible. And that is phenomenal. And we have to do that same thing for the completion agenda. You can't increase by 50% the number of poor people coming to college and not do something differently to get them to the finish line for graduation. And we've got a lot of great models. Thank you. It's, uh, it's all of you doing this work. And we've got a lot of great models that will work. The dual enrollment model with community colleges and high schools and four-year institutions, streamlining articulation. There's just too much bureaucracy. Students don't know what to take, and they take too many courses they don't need. And we need to fix remedial programs. That system is broken. We cannot do remedial like we've done it before. Students aren't going to wait four years to move up a grade level or two or three. It's too frustrating. We've got to do boot camps. And there are all kinds of models out there that we hope we can really identify and scale at the federal level. Um, you know, in terms of student loan, um, the president has recently proposed capping monthly payments at levels that people can afford. Um, this is to address college affordability. And we're calling it our pay-as-you-earn proposal that builds on our existing income-based repayment. Uh, if you want to go into public service, you would pay no more than 10% of your adjusted uh, gross income after taxes. 
and within 10 years, your loans would be forgiven after 10 years if you make regular payments. So if you actually bring home. So income-based repayment is some, something to really look at. And you know the other thing we're doing is to look at, uh, at the state level, at college completion incentive grants. We've proposed this in the budget for this year. It may not be funded, but we'll come back with it in some other form again. Um, to really reward states and institutions for undertaking systemic reforms that will increase the number of students who complete college, that close the achievement gap, and serve more of those Pell eligible students. And first in the world is another proposal we've, we've asked uh, the government, the Congress for, to accelerate learning. It's sort of a modified FIPSI program. It kind of takes the lessons learned from I3 and creates for higher education something similar to investing in innovation where you can really do the kinds of things to accelerate student learning and achievement, use technology in new and, and exciting ways. We've given states toolkits. Uh, it's called the College Completion Toolkit. You can see it on the website if you're interested. And you can see what we hope states will do, which will create plans um, that actually have college completion as an explicit goal. Right now, we've got about 20 states that have done so. We've got 30 to go. And we're tracking every state, and we're tracking metrics about how you do that. And these are laid out in the, in the College Completion Toolkit. And it's actually 26 states, and many institutions are setting completion targets, um, which are very exciting. Now, the targets are all different, and that's another problem that we've had in K-12 that we hope not to replicate in higher education. Um, the last part of my remarks are going to talk more about technology. I think a lot of you have come to think about technology in new ways. And earlier this year, we were able to, with a whole year and a half worth of work with the Department of Labor, issue $500 million in uh, grants that were called Trade Adjustment for Community College Grants. Some of you received those grants. Um, the goals of those grants were very simple, again, to produce better educational outcomes for students and jobs for them. So employment outcomes and academic outcomes together. And it's the first installment of a $2 billion fund that was made available when we passed uh, the Pell Grant Reform Act in, in 2010 to really think about how are we going to reform community colleges as, as I call them, the middle child. I spent a lot of my career in community colleges. The middle child in education, the segue between high school and the four-year universities, the segue between adult education and, uh, and, and college in general, the segue between people that didn't get a chance and came in because you could, anyone could be served through that gateway. So the idea is to really leverage the power of community colleges to do a lot more. And we've had a lot of university chancellors and business leaders saying it's an unsung song. It's something, it's a, it's a, it's a whole sector of education that has not been well understood. And so this money is bringing to the fore the kinds of consortia. We've allowed consortia to come together, business partners, technology partners, academic partners, to figure out what could we do differently in STEM, in the STEM pipeline from community colleges to four-year universities to the workforce. What could we do differently in articulation? What could we do differently between adult education and higher education? So those grants are going to be coming out again this spring. We hope you'll apply for those. And we hope you'll, maybe in this conference and other places you go, get into the kinds of consortia that are going to solve these, these kinds of challenges that we have. Kevin Carey called this whole grant program uh, one of the, and, and he's a leading policy scholar in Washington, DC. He works at Ed Sector, and he's somebody I greatly respect. And he called the whole design of this grant program one of the most innovative federal higher education programs ever conceived uh, because under the grant terms, all of the high quality evidence-based instruction that is going to be created with these funds will be open source, will be openly available. Mike Smith is here and Mark Milliron and uh, lots of other people in the audience who are experts in open educational resources so that if a course is created or a whole program is created from one of the parts of the country from a consortia, it will all be licensed under Creative Commons by license, BY, which is going to allow public and private partners to use this content uh, for derivative purposes. So that's very exciting for us. And the Open Group, which is funded by the Gates Foundation, is going to help the grantees. The grantees were awarded in September. They're helping the grantees 
look at how to integrate advanced learning technologies and these kinds of practices so that when the grants are delivered, the final uh, outcomes are delivered, this content will be available to everyone. So that's very exciting, and it's one example of a new drive to invest in aggressively and to collaborate widely uh, in developing innovative education technologies. We've also proposed a $90 million fund for a new, what we call ARPA-ED, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Education. It's going to be built along DARPA, um, and, and those of you know about that, which helped develop the internet, GPS, and robotics. And ARPA-ED is a design that would aggressively pursue great breakthrough technologies with potential to reform teaching and learning. We've got a lot of exciting people thinking about that, and I hope you'll get involved in that. And through Karen Cater's work in the office, um, we have a national education technology plan, and we have a new digital promise launch. It's got people on it from the major companies and uh, technology leaders and entrepreneurs on the board. And Digital Promise is going to really focus on cross-cutting technology R&D, especially in the learning sciences, uh, technology and education. And it's got a very distinguished board that is going to look at the kind of powerful models that can be used in every phase across the board in all of teaching and learning. So this group is going to help us document what students know and can do, how much new knowledge they can acquire, whether they sh instead of whether they just showed up for class. And the technologies are going to also help us learn about how to accelerate learning. How can students learn more? Uh, how can we use branching features in technology so the students don't have to relearn what they already know? And I think we've got experts in the front here who know what, I, who know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I think that's part of, I think, the, the beauty of this kind of conference where you can really share this kind of knowledge and come away with some new ideas that will make things better for students. Um, so all in all, we've got to leverage these new technologies. We've got um, the Department of Education partnering with the Department of Labor, as I said, but a new one is with Veterans Affairs, uh, who have joined together with the Department of Education, the MacArthur Foundation, and Mozilla and Haystack, hosted by Duke University and the University of California Humanities Research Institute, uh, who are all coming together with venture capital to develop what's called digital badges. Badges uh, are, are being thought about as having some promise to account for formal and informal learning experiences and to give students badges, like when you were a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout, uh, to document what you know and can do, as I said before. And badging could take place anywhere. We hope you'll apply for this competition. Um, we're asking for the leading thinkers in the country to think about how badges could be used to give credit to students for what they have learned. And so it really is sort of an outside pushing in model uh, that is going to hopefully maybe shake up the credit model in some new ways so that we can look at how, how we can document learning in a broader set of environments and across a wider range of content. Um, so as you can see from what I've shared, we're seeking to foster innovation and change uh, all for the purpose of increasing quality, ramping up student achievement, as I said, uh, by increasing productivity and affordability to have the greatest impact that we possibly can. Digital learning resources are going to help us save significantly on textbook costs. Uh, I should say a minute about that. I was fortunate to hear the um, head of the, the state superintendent of Utah stand up and say all of the content and science for the entire state's K-12 schools uh, is going to be open and it's going to, instead of spending $85 a student, spend $5 a student starting in the fall. So that's one tiny example of, you know, can you take that $80 and do something differently to personalize learning to help those students that aren't succeeding get a better shot at really doing well in college. And as more and more students are using these digital tools, we've got vast amounts of data being, uh, you know, developed, and you all know this. You all see the cloud, and you see what's in the cloud, and we think big data is going to help us better understand how students learn and what opportunities work best for which students in which context, or even what behaviors may indicate that they are at risk of dropping out. So tonight, uh, right before I close these remarks, I'm delighted to announce an exciting new initiative at the department 
which is focused on using new kinds of data to help educators make more informed decisions at all levels. And it's called the Evidence Framework for Innovation and Excellence in Education. Um, learners and all of those people who shape learning experiences, the students themselves, their parents, teachers, principals, product developers, policymakers, they make decisions every day about educational opportunities. Learning technology developers want to know how to improve the effectiveness of their products. Policymakers want to know if their state or district should invest in a product they heard about, they heard was effective, it was being used in the district over there. Teachers want to understand how the new learning technology will benefit an individual student or a group of students in their classes. And parents and students want to have the best education that they can and actually se se select the educational pathway that is most suited to their individual needs and contexts. So again, Karen Cater of our office is convening a panel of researchers and technology experts to identify ways to gather and analyze data from learning technologies and online environments that will provide evidence to help answer these questions. And with your help and best ideas, we hope you'll get involved in this. We'd like to develop a policy framework for research on technology-supported innovations that will leverage the state of the art, the new emerging field of learning analytics, the learning sciences that haven't really been well documented, all of the research that's going on in the learning analytics uh, modes has just yet to be brought to bear on our classrooms and really bring together the best uh, researchers and practitioners to really expand the quality and quantity of 21st century supported learning. So our focus is going to share, explore, and construct these evidence frameworks that will support better design, better development, adaptation, scaling, and adoption of the best learning technologies we can find that will be broadly conceived. And like the National Ed Te Education Technology Plan, this is going to be a very public and open process. And so we hope all of you will just participate in this evidence framework discussion. And we actually have an evidence uh, framework .sri.com website set up that you can go to. And in the audience here are Bernadette Adams Yates, who's joined us at the Big Ideas Fest. If you just put your hand up, Bernadette, I'm not sure where you are. Yes, there she is. Um, and also Barbara Means and Kaya Anderson, can you, you guys are all at this table, um, who are helping us with this evidence framework effort. So we'd like to know what kinds of education decisions you're making, how you use evidence, if you have ideas about what is the most relevant evidence that you would think we should bring to bear nationally, locally, and statewide. So in closing, you know, I've talked uh, sort of a roundabout. I've given you a whole plethora of what we're doing in early learning, K-12, higher education. Uh, the overall goal, as I said, is to reach not only better achievement levels at the 2020 year so that we're not resting on our laurels, we're not complacent, and we've got to ramp up what students know and can do in this next decade. It's fundamental. The president talks about this pretty much any time he talks about education. And hopefully, you've had a little bit of insight as to how we think about these different levers, whether it's the lever of transparency. I've got all the default rates and all the graduation rates now on the website. You know, How can we use this information to spur better education for students? And how can we learn from the best, from the best practices we can find, from the best evidence that we can garner? So I think these levers of change are critically important. And we've got to, I think, return to, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, return to that continuing linkage between preserving the ideals that we cherish and produce uh, an educated citizenry who is able to advocate for these ideals. You know, we're not doing that now. You can just look at the public conversations. Uh, we had 400 institutions that gathered around and volunteered to conduct interfaith dialogues on their campuses. Uh, the quality of conversation is not what we need it to be, and certainly the quality of student learning and achievement is not what we, we need for this country going forward. So by promoting all of these reforms, um, we are going to move forward. We're very ambitious in Washington. Our doors are open. We hope you know all of us are first name dot last name at ed.gov. You can reach us. You can talk to us. Um, this is a government that wants to hear from you and wants you to participate. 
And you know, what we're all about is really creating the environment to entrust our democracy to future generations. And if we don't do this now, it's not going to happen. That's why people like me left everything I love and came to Washington. It's not going to happen unless it happens over the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. So I just want to thank you for your commitment for being the nation's leaders, um, thought leaders, and, and innovators, and entrepreneurs, and thinkers. And I hope you'll use these couple days to give us your best ideas, because we need them in Washington, and we've got to do better than we have in the last couple decades. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions now.